welcome, welcome, welcome to the Fantasy Fangirls Podcast, where two sisters dive deep into beloved fantasy lore, characters, themes, theories, and more. And before we dive into chapters 16 through 20 of Fourth Wing, we want to quickly address all of the recent Iron Flame news, because, wow, there's been a lot. So Rebecca Yaros's book tour tickets are sold out, and they sold out in, like, literally seconds for almost every single location. Unfortunately, as much as we really, really tried, shouts to Nicole for really trying there, we did miss out on the Colorado Springs event. But there are going to be hundreds of midnight release parties as well at bookstores across the U.S., I believe some in Canada as well to ring in, of course, the release of Iron Flame. So Nicole and I, we are going to be going to the one just outside of Denver and Glendale at the Barnes & Noble there. So if you are going to be going to that location as well, we would love to see you say hi. Another quick housekeeping note, we are going to be doing an Ask Us Anything episode. So if you want our thoughts on theories, if you want our thoughts on silly questions, whatever it is, please send in your questions via email. We are fantasyfangirlspod at gmail.com. You can also DM us on Instagram and or TikTok or even comment on this YouTube video if you're watching on YouTube. But please, please, please send us in your questions. We cannot wait for that episode. Now back to today's episode. Like always, we do have our content warning. We at Fantasy Fangirl podcast are adults who talk about adult things about an adult book. Violet and Zayden are alone in her room for the first time in this stretch of chapters and Boy, does this guy know how to undo a corset to look at her ribs. Get your mind out of the gutter, fam. We also talk spoilers. So everything from the entire Fourth Wing book, the Iron Flame excerpt that was recently dropped, and speculations, and of course, anything from Rebecca Yaros is on the table. So if you didn't know that dragons have a phrase that is, for fuck's sake, then please go listen to the audiobook instead. We will be here when you're done with your first read-through and desperately need to talk to people about it. About it. We are the people who will talk to you about this. And now let us reach bonded, mutually assured destruction with our favorite morally gray shadow daddy. Now, before we begin our deep dive into the stretch of chapters, as always, let's begin with our battle brief or the summary of what happens in chapters 16 through 20 of Fourth Wing. Chapter 16, Our girl definitely knows how to be memorable. After telling the Roll Keeper that she has bonded two dragons, the leaders of Bezgaeth needlessly argue while Violet's wounds are treated by Professor Kaori, a very shocked Professor Kaori. Then the irate Jack Barlow finds out that she's bonded Taren, and let's just say the look on his face, it's priceless. The Empyrean takes off to meet about this highly irregular occurrence, and Taren tells Violet to stay with the wing leader. Yes, sir, I will. But as she's celebrating with the remaining first years of her squad, Dane comes and takes her away and tells her, A, leadership is going to make her choose a dragon, and B, that she will choose Andarna. Violet is furious with him and says she refuses to choose, and why the hell would she not keep Taren? Then Dane gives us a delicious download. Taren and Segal are mated pairs, meaning Violet and Zayden are now bound for life. Forced proximity just got that much tastier. Speaking of our new bound buddy, our favorite shadow daddy enters the conversation and tells Dane to go away. Thank you, Zayden. As he ups the stakes even higher, their survival now depends on each other because Taren's bonds are so powerful and so deep that mated pairs' lives are interdependent. If Taren's rider dies, aka Violet, he dies, then Segale dies, then Zayden dies. Dun, dun, dun. The dragon return and our girl gets both the dragons since they are basically like well this isn't a rule so uh sure but then Dane the stain has to make it all about him and finally excited for our girl he pulls her in for a kiss but Violet doesn't want him anymore and a cheer goes over the fandom chapter 17 look who finally has her own room hooray for privacy and it looks like many of the writers need said privacy as they celebrated after threshing the cafeteria at breakfast is something out of mean girls with jack barlow getting pushed out of his table very deserved my guy and violet is suddenly very popular particularly with the older members of her squad imogen the pink-haired mark one who almost ripped off her arm in sparring the first time says 
that she will now be training her in weightlifting. And it doesn't take her long to realize that our favorite wing leader has made the order. Later on at flying lessons, we learn that Taryn is a goody goody student, Hermione Granger style. And after Violet tells him to release the bounds that he has on her legs, keeping her in place, Violet falls off him again and again and again. And again, and right before weightlifting with Imogen, Dane finds her to say, Violet, I, we can't be together anymore. Great, dude. So excited. Violet begins her training with Imogen and wonders if that fierce loyalty is from lover's connection between Imogen and Zayden. She is obviously not jealous. Chapter 18. One month later, we learn that Violet has been set to the archives duty and feels right back at home. But the never ending threats continue as our friends learn that if they don't show signs of a signet in about six months, they'll basically explode. Not terrifying at all. Dane corners Violet as she dismounts Taryn after a flying lesson and lays into her and they finally have it fully out. Violet saying, maybe you're some of the bullshit that this place will cut away from me. Fucking yes, finally. Later that night, Violet is having a lovely dream when Taryn wakes her up through their mind to mind bond. She's seen seven people in her room, six of which are unbound first years and they are out for blood. Just as Violet is about to die at Orrin Seifert's hands, literally, Violet hears and Darna fill her head and time stops. Chapter 19, Violet is capital C corn fused. And just as she goes through the doorway, there is a pissed Zayden walking through the door and time resumes again. Zayden kills everybody in the room without a second thought. And Garrick and Bodhi are on cleanup duty. This is going to be a very common theme for these two sidekick characters. Zayden checks Violet's wounds in the way that, yes, I will be talking about for 65 minutes. Thank you. Realizing that her ribs are not broken, the two whisk off to go see Taryn Segal and Andarna. And we get a middle of the night dragon info dump that Lexi will be talking about for 45 minutes. We learn that Indarna is a baby, but she will be fully grown in a year or so. And that all dragons have gifts that are completely separate from the signet that they channel to their rider. What? But baby dragons are able to gift their powers, and Andarda did just that. Go, my girl. A stunned Zayden and Violet agree that with these dragons, no one can know about this. As they walk back to the college, Zayden questions Violet about how people got into her room. Dun, dun, dun. Chapter 20. It's formation the next morning, and after the death roll is read off, Zayden tells Dane that there's been a change in his squad. Is that Liam Mari entering our story? Why, yes, it is is uh, finally infuriated violet fights back against her bodyguard assignment and thank god she loses that battle if you can even call it that zayden's kind of a op but then commandant pancheck announces that there's been an accusation that needs to be addressed zayden steps up and accuses wing leader amber mavis of attacking violet in her sleep dane is Fucking, fucking Dane. Dane is livid that Violet would, major air quotes, lie and commands her to right this wrong. He then lifts his hand to cups her face, demanding the memory from her. Woof. If he had any points left, he lost them all in this stretch of chapters. Violet, of course, doesn't allow him to do this. And Taryn shares the memory of Amber from last night with the other dragons who then share it with their writers. The other two wing leaders and Zayden are in unanimous agreement that Amber is fucking guilty. And realizing what's about to happen, Violet unsuccessfully begs her dragon not to kill her. But Taryn rightly so, roasts Amber into the shish kebab she deserves to be. Huzzah! 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 <laughs> and so now let's tap into our signet powers and talk about key insights, reflections, foreshadowings, and all of our favorites, the theories. I want to talk about the chapter 16 opening real quick because from Professor Kaori's Guide to Dragon Kind, he mentions that there's nothing known about how dragons govern themselves and that there is a clear hierarchy. A few episodes, or maybe it was just last episode, What is Time? It's an illusion. But you mentioned this idea of Andarna being royal. And I I'm, I'm convinced, like I have bought, I've leapt into this theory with you entirely. I'm really just hearing that. And I'm like, wow, like that really supports the theory. Also, when Melgren is making the announcement later, he forgets Andarna's name. He like remembers Taryn and like, you know, Taryn's glory. But then he's like, and he talks to his aide. He's like, what's his, what's her name? What's, give me. If Andarna is royal, that would just make it so much sweeter. Yes, I'm so glad that you are on board with this theory. And, and you know, like I use, we use, we say royal as in whatever the dragon equivalent to that is. They obviously have a hierarchy. 
There is so much about dragon culture that we don't know about, which of course we talked about in the last episode, focused on dragons in the archive section. I, I really do think that Andarna is extra special in more ways than one. But Professor Kaori does bring up a really good question. Why do dragons only bond with one writer rather than go for the odds with two? I have my thoughts, but I want to hear yours first, Nicole. My guess is like, my thought is just like, this is how it's been. This is how it shall be kind of a thing. But I also, I'm a big Formula One fan and you know, there's every, for every one team of car, there's two drivers, right? And they each get the same car. And I think about it like that, like those two team members are constantly fighting each other. And it's like, if one dragon bonds two riders, like that would be tough also how would signets work you know like would they develop the same signet would they get two different signets would the only one of them get a signet i just think it would be so much of like a competition and you, no one wants that like because there's going to be one who's more bonded than the other and like how sad <laughs> so that's a really good point i hadn't thought of it like that i definitely thought it had something to do with the transfer of magic and the humans might not fully understand it but there is so much more to this transfer of power and this partnership that the dragons and the humans have that I think the one bonded writer definitely has to do with that. Also, we just know, you know, dragons, how they are with their mated bonds. They, you know, I'm not surprised. They're very monogamous. And so I'm not surprised that that extends to their writer as well. That's a great <laughs> point. So there's this moment post-threshing when Professor Kaori, first and foremost, I love, I love that Professor Kaori is the one helping Violet with her ankle in the medical tent. I do wonder where the healers are because they don't really mention any healer. They call it the healer's tent if, I, if memory serves. Don't quote me on that. But like, if I remember, they call it the healer's tent. And then Professor Kaori is just there like helping out. And I love that. That's just so great. He's probably um, like pushing past everybody else. Like I need to talk to her. And then like, <laughs> he doesn't actually really talk to her about it, but like he just needs to be in the presence of, I don't, I don't know. It's just, I can just have in this the presence visual. of such greatness. <laughs> like, to, to be fair, he is the only person who actually believes in Violet. Like I have this note in just a second, but like he really believes in Violet. He mentions how much smarter she is than Mira and Brennan. He knew that something like this, maybe not to this degree, but he knew that something really special was going to happen. So I would not be surprised if he was like, move, move. I got to get closer. I got to get closer. But like, and but what we were just saying is he doesn't actually mention bonding to dragons. Violet says at one point, like if Professor Gori asks her how her injuries are and she notes like, yeah, he's not asking the question he actually wants to ask. I think that it is because there are such stringent rules against talking about your bond. You know, we, we learned this way earlier in the book when Violet and Dane were, she was asking him almost like forbidding questions about his bond with um, with Kath. You know, in the next seven, seven-ish months of our story, the only time that at least I recall her being questioned about bonding to, with two dragons is when she talks to Dane's dad. And, yep. you know, he says the scribes have been studying this and they want to study her dragon. But she, you Ugh. know, very politely refuses for obvious reasons. You'd think that she would be questioned about this more openly. And I wonder if she's particularly going to start getting, I'll even say interrogated about it by first years when she is a second year in Iron Flame because they're like, yo, how the fuck did you just do that? Like, I want to do that too, sort of attitude. Yeah. So I don't know. Like, it's just, it's really emphasizes without saying it outright, the, the strength and how sacred that bond is that no one else is asking her about this, even though we know the scribes are studying it. I love that point. And I didn't even think about what that's going to bring to next year. You all know me. I have to take every single opportunity to point out this hardened culture because Violet, okay, she refuses Nolan, the mender, because she, quote unquote, can't afford to appear weak. She just bonded the most powerful dragon who wasn't supposed to bond and a second dragon like and she's worried about looking weak i again i am fully in the i fully support the world building about the, this hardened culture you all know that but this is one instance where i'm like i'm sorry she would heal faster if she was mended and she would be stronger faster so why is that not like what is the point of a mender if it's weak to get mended that's a great question, actually. I just, but I do wonder, I do wonder if Jack wasn't in the tent, if she would have done the same thing. Also, Dane, literally in chapter, I, it was in like the second stretch of chapters that we did. Dane literally said like, don't fix her so that she'll be weaker so that she'll go to the scribes. And now here she is saying, don't fix me because I'll appear strong. I'm confused by that logic, guys. <laughs> I, I am too. 
again, it's just like, I'm just going to chalk it up to a super twisted uh, psychology that they have. I would want to get mended personally so I could be stronger, quicker, because Jack Barlow is looking at me like he still wants to fucking kill me. Uh huh. And knowing Orin you know? is unbonded? Yeah, I'd want like, you know. to get mended pretty fucking fast. Since your download of dragon names, I have been listening for dragon names in such a different way. And I actually made a list of all the ones that we hear this episode. So Bade is the first one, which is Jack's dragon. I could not find it in Gaelic, but Urban Dictionary is like, oh, I bade goodbye to you. It means goodbye, which I find fucking hilarious. <laughs> Then we also have Fierg, which is Rhee's dragon, which means anger, which I, I could see that. That makes a lot of sense to me. We have Iotrum, which is Riddick's dragon, which means light. Just pause here. So he is an ice wielder. So this doesn't really line up with, with our theories about the dragon names, unless you, you know, just wanting to think of him as a lighthearted character. That's exactly what I thought. The second I saw light, I was like, oh, it's because he's the comedic relief. Like, that's fucking brilliant. And of that same thinking, line of thinking, anger isn't resignant. It's summoning. Sleeg, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, I hope, is Sawyer's dragon, which means slice. And I, I was really, I was kind of taken aback by it, but you have a really good point here. Yeah, well, so like, you know, his signet is wielding metal. So slice from the metal, you know, like that, that checks out. And then we have Kath, which is Dane's dragon. That means battle, but I you have some notes here and you actually have it written in invisible ink. So I can't read it. Yes. I love that we've started doing this with each other. Oh, so we can have like surprises on the show. So I also looked at Urban Dictionary because Kath it equals battle. And while, you know, like we can make that check out, I dug a little bit deeper. And so Urban Dictionary has the best definition for this, like screw the battle definition. And I am convinced that it was Rebecca's intended meeting because it means someone who is really annoying or acting really annoying. <laughs> That is my new meaning for Kath, is someone who is really annoying or acting really annoying. You're welcome. <laughs> oh, my God. That is that is canon. That is canon for me. Oh, my God. And then we have, I'm going to mispronounce this. It's Schmoud, Schmied, Schmack, Schmied, S-M-A-C-H-D, which is Professor Kaori's dragon, which means control. That checks out. Yeah. yeah so I, I want to bring up a question, and I don't really have quite an answer for it, but Liz emailed us with a really good thinking question here about dragon names and the channeled signets that people get from them. How does it work with the dragon's previous writer? Because, for instance, Taryn's previous writer was a siphon. So how does that match up to Thunder? I, I really did a Google deep dive trying to find any way that they could really, you know, match up with each other. I didn't. I couldn't. We know, for instance, that the dragon's names stay the same, as Liz pointed out. So, you know, they're not changing their names to match with, you know, the signet power, right? So how does that work? I want to hear your thoughts. I have a not fun theory answer for this. I, my thoughts is just like, it's from a very boring standpoint, is if I'm a writer writing a story, I'd want it to match with their current. I'm thinking of that this was very my, logically. That I'm was like, my <laughs> not fun. That was exactly okay, what I was well. thinking. I'm going to say that I don't think that there is any, I'll say, in book theory or rhyme or reason to the dragon names and their writer's signets. I do believe that just from a writing standpoint that Rebecca it was a way of, you know, more subtle character building. I think it was a great hint for us with Day and Ice and Liam and Ice Wielding and Farsight. So it gives that hint to the second second signet. But I think that, yeah, it was just a in the moment applies to this particular story. And that's the dragon's name. But the benefits we get from it with like finding the match it so outweighs that it's just logical. Like it's so outweighs that in, in my mind, at least. Like and Darna being second honor. Yes, absolutely. So there is my answer for you, Liz. Thank you so much for asking that question. I do have a question about the second honor. I'm so bought into this and Darna is royal theory. Like everything in my mind is just going through that filter. But what is if Indarna is the second daughter dragon or second child of the dragon hierarchies of the dragon royals so that's another way the second honor comes into play I have no idea I'm just whatever I can do to make this theory work I will do it Dane in this stretch of chapters takes the biggest L's yet and this it's is so part bad. one Violet is celebrating with her friends and Dane has a habit in these next set of chapters of making this huge day for Violet like this is up there with your wedding day the day your first kid is born like this is like the day your life changes for forever and he is making it 
all about fucking him. She's celebrating with her squad and he literally spins her around by her shoulders. And all he has to say is that she's hurt and that she has to come with him. He's mm. just so controlling. It just like literally makes my skin crawl as I'm reading it. It is just so at odds. Because in last section, we talked about threshing and you know how Zayden, when Violet starts bonding with Taryn, Zayden and Sigale leave. And my headcanon as to why they leave is like, this is a big moment for them. Like, let, th- let them have that moment together. So Dane takes her to the edge of the field. And I love this. It says, where we're hidden in shadow. So shadow is super important here because that means Zayden has full access to this entire conversation, also making his appearance later just totally non-surprising. There's no congratulations, no holy shit, you're amazing. Nope. Uh, Just again, he's demanding for answers. Like, have you noticed that this is a bit of a pattern with him? Also, after Violet fights back saying, I'm not choosing, he's like, yes, you are. You know, he actually says this twice. And when she pushes back, he gaslights her by confirming that she trusts him. That, that right there, reading that, I was like, oh my God. He's like, you trust me, right? Don't you? And she's like, yeah. And he's like, you're choosing Andarna. Not a question. It's always a statement with him or like a command. Our girl literally just bonded the second most powerful dragon in Navarre. And he's like, you're going to choose Andarna because you can't ride her. And therefore, this also brings me to something that Mira says way, way, way when we're in the outpost in a few chapters. She says to Violet, you can also hold someone back from becoming who they're truly meant to be. And that is one of the (laughs) and that is also some way that you can ruin someone. Huh. What is fucking Dane doing right here? Oh, my gosh. When we get to that outpost part, I was just rereading that because I'm like trying to catch up. But that was such a good point. Like she and she even says to Dane, she's like, I would not have told my sister to go and stay with you if I knew you were going to treat her like this. This, Yeah. Paraphrasing. I'm also looking at this through like maybe there's another layer to this besides him just being a controlling dickwad. I think he is very jealous that she now has a direct lifetime connection now to Zayden. And he is so jealous of that. So that's another reason why he was like, choose Andarna. A 150 million percent there. Yes. <laughs> Friends, we're going to be really fired up about Dane this episode. I like, I I'm really like hope. I'm sweating already. <laughs> I'm like sweating. Okay. When Dane is talking yes. about how Zayden is going to get her killed, he also brings up a good point about Melgren. Quote, at least you know what you're getting when it comes to Melgren, showing how much faith Dane has in leadership, how much trust he has in the system, very much like Violet used to have. Even if Melgren is terrifying, Dane is like, nope, like, remember, leadership, they're the good guys. This is how we grew up. Like, that's understandably how he feels now. Moving forward from Dane for now, what do you make of Taryn saying, as it should be twice when the decision for her to be bonded with two dragons stands. What do I think? I have no fucking clue. But what do I think? I know that there's so much to that line that I will probably not fully understand until like 2027. And that's just something I've accepted. <laughs> so like he because he, he can't only be talking about the humans agreeing to the dragon's choice because he first says it as his answer to Violet when the dragons just returned from the Empyrean meeting. Why is this how it should be? Like, I I really do think that this goes right back to why Andarna participating in threshing. We've talked a lot about that already. I am so not done talking about that. We're going to talk about it more in this episode. Why are more people not talking about this on the internet? I I don't have any answers, but I really think we we need to all be collectively thinking about why why should it be this way? Back to Dane, but at least this time we're adding Zayden to it. So they have this face off and we have another example here of Dane stepping in front of Violet while Zayden steps to the side. So if in case you've missed it, Rebecca Yaros has talked endlessly in interviews about how Dane often steps in front of Violet or steps between Violet, especially in these first, you know, half of this book, while Zayden constantly steps to the side of her or even just shuts the fuck up and lets her speak, which she he did at the end of the gauntlet. It says, quote, he, Dane, puts himself between us. Those little moments are so, so, so important because it is literally Dane saying, you don't have this, I have this for you so that I feel like I can be in control and I feel like I can have like this like alpha male protection over you. Fucking it finally takes the bond for her to realize that Zayden isn't going to kill her. It finally dawns on her like, oh my God, Zayden isn't going to kill me. And I do wonder if the bond opening up had something to do with it dawning on her or if this timing is just super convenient. What are your thoughts? 
Well, so so Violet still hasn't like technically warmed up to Zayden as she's frequently bringing up that he's only looking out for himself. Yes, she knows that he, I'll say, trusts that he's not going to actively try to kill her now, but she still doesn't trust that he as a person doesn't want her dead. And yeah. he, she still thinks that he hates her and wishes he could be responsible for killing her. It's just like very inconvenient now for him. Mm-hmm. There's that outburst that Zayden has where he's like, well, the yes. fuck aware. Yes. And it, it felt just so out of nowhere. Like, is he so on edge in this entire time where he's like, it just took that one, you know, cat hair on a gaping open wound to just make him go, you know, like freak out. She does also say, she, Violet, does also say later on in the next stretch of chapters, because I'm working on episode five right now, she says like, what would I do to be the one that he lost control with? And like, I've never seen Zayden lose control. I would count this as losing control, in my opinion. Just maybe not in the way she wants him to. But, like, I would count this as, like, this big outburst. Is Whoa, buddy, you just, like, lost the deep level of control that you have over yourself on any given moment. I similarly have been dwelling on this, right? Like, I was, like, rewrite it a few times. I was trying to look at it from different angles. And here's my incomplete thoughts on it. He's feeling quite the mix of emotions, while, which you know, I know you're going to be talking about here in a moment. But, you know, for one, he's proud of her for standing up to those three bigger cadets and for, and for being courageous. And he also feels out of control of his own situation. You know, he's a guy who very much likes to be in control and he does not feel that right now. And lastly, he's feeling such a strong sense of responsibility, you know, just like he has with the other marked ones. It's like, gosh, damn it, another person that I have to be responsible for. And not only is it just another person, but it's the person whose family is directly responsible for me being responsible for those 107 other people. There's some complex emotions in there that and I don't think Zayden's going to go to a therapist to work it out. <laughs> did there? What, what would that be in the healer's quadrant, do you think? Like, do they have like, you know, the ca- on campus therapist that? my school tried to do and utterly failed my therapist told me I would only be happy if I moved to Sedona Arizona thank you very much I appreciate it well I'll go ahead and talk about this because I I do think that this is important here's my three doors that I think it could it could be number one all of the responsibility for the marked ones and who knows what could happen if he dies like he is literally responsible for 107 people and later he says unfortunately for Everyone involved, and those are italicized, there's now an us. Everyone involved is not just Zayden and Violet. That's the other 107 marked ones. And also not just Taryn and Sigal either. They're included in that as well. It's so much more than than the four of them. Door number two is... He has so much to do still with the rebellion and suddenly his death feels more out of his control. And if he is now kind of like being brought up to lead the second half of the rebellion, that's like his death is now completely out of his control. And number three, yes, the woman he loves might die. That would piss me the fuck off too. If someone was like, yeah, Brett might die at any given second. I would be like, the fuck what? Like I'd be so pissed. But also he doesn't want to have feelings for her. And I think that he's pretty fucking pissed that he does. And I think that that conflict is also going at it. And the fact that she now is even a bigger target, it's like this woman I'm falling in love with is now an even bigger target. Are you fucking kidding me? Can't I just have one person in my life who loves me and I love them and them not be ripped away from me? I, I have a lot of questions about how they he feels for her, if he's really in love with her, like that. And, and I... I'm not going to go there right now. This is where your logic and my emotion totally don't see eye to eye. I want to just point out real quick, because later on we get like Zayden, you know, coming into a room, he kills everyone. And then they have like that moment, capital M moment. I had like a full page on that moment and nothing on the dragon download (laughs) yet. I hadn't gotten to it yet. I don't think. worry, everyone. I, I Don't worry, everyone. I got you on the dragon <laughs> download I, for my fellow logical readers here. Anyway. Also in this section where Zayden and Dane are facing off, Zayden gives her some fucking credit while taking Dane down a peg and it is delicious. He kind of loses some points though because then he says Soringale is the last person on the continent I would want chained to me. The fact that Zayden Ryerson recovers from this is quite impressive so like it, okay so i i just have to say this it's moments like this that i do have a little bit of a hard time with romance development of the book you all know i love this book i love zayden i love violet and i believe that there is more context and we will eventually get why he treats her this way but until then like it's hard to not take it at face value or 
just consider him the world's best actor. He's just unable to admit his true feelings for her himself right now. And that's why he's so inconsistent. You know, he's a 23 year old guy. We have to remember these. <laughs> Like, we all remember boys when they were 23 years old. If you're listening and you're a 23-year-old boy, no offense. I promise it does get better. Here's my thing. When it comes to this enemies to lover stuff, there is that meanness when it comes to the jargon. And that never really bothers me. In fact, if anything, it sweetens the pot, which... I don't know what that says about me. <laughs> I think that maybe I have, I'll, I'll say this, I have such high expectations for how this can play out. I think that it, it, it does boil down to the fact that like there is some very harsh language shared between these two people. She says, I hate you at one point and she recovers from that. It's not like how a normal romance or perceived enemies to lovers would go. Like this, I do think has an element of like, I do fucking hate you. And for me personally, that just increases the tension. And what makes like, you know, right before their kiss scene where he's like, I like making you squirm, shit like that, so much more delicious. There's this moment where Dane leaves or Zayden makes Dane leave. And Zayden gives us the capital U.S. us download. And this shit is delicious. We learn that if Violet dies through the chain of events, Zayden would die as well. This was the moment that this book, like it already, in my opinion, was really, really set and really good. This was the moment where this book went boop, 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 like up another level. And I was like, Oh my God. I also just love faded mates, bonds, all that kind of stuff. Cause we obviously get the mates through the dragons. I have a feeling where we might get some Zayden violet faded mate stuff, whether it's like right outly said, or if it's way more beneath the surface, I don't know. But this was the moment where I was not only hooked on this book, but I became quite literally obsessed. So I just love that moment. Okay, so right after that, there's this moment where Garrick tries to approach Zayden and literally Zayden turns and he's like, mm-mm, 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 go away. <laughs> like Zayden, and then Garrick literally like does like a brrrp and like turns around and then he leaves. That was not included by accident. Like that is such a weird moment where it's like, what the fuck? Why do you think that was included? I don't know. Like, uh, honestly, I miss this part. I I, I think that's, there's that's how hidden it is. Yeah, like, I think there's something to it. I love my boy Garrick. I am such a ride or die for these side characters. Man. <laughs> you really are. And I'm I know. For it. Somebody's got to represent them. I don't think Garrick would come over and tell Zayden anything about the outposts. Leadership no. is literally right there. I don't think that that's what would happen. But like, why is Garrick desperately trying to go over and like tell Zayden something? And I love that Zayden is like, I'm with my girl right now. Fucking leave. Maybe it's kind of a moment when Garrick realizes that there is something more going on so like Garrick is just kind of casually going up to Zayden because that's what they do with each other and this is the moment that Zayden almost like draws a line and is like nope like I got to talk to her right now like we we're we're in a thing now sort of here's another thing maybe Garrick was coming up to congratulate Violet because he's been so like go Violet yes he would do that (laughs) unlike someone else we know fucking Dane God fucking damn it, Dane. We're not there yet. Uh, there's a lot of face touching in this fucking stretch of chapters. I'm so excited. Now, I don't know if I love this idea, but I'm just going to present it. What if Garrick also kind of has a thing for Violet and he was coming up to like talk to her and Zayden was like, nope, mine. I don't think I love that idea. I really like Garrick and Imogen, that, Ooh, yeah. that idea together, but I don't know, just speculating. So I'm going to try to keep this short because I will probably be talking about Zayden being an intrinsic in every single episode from here on out. But right when Violet thinks about Zayden, this is after Melgren and Lilith's announcement where they like put their hands up to megaphone their voice, basically, we get another scalp prickle moments she was thinking about Zayden in that moment did he hear her from across the field thinking about him and he wants to read her mind to see what she was thinking I do not like the this theory it makes Zayden a huge invader of privacy and in fact I'll even say this in a similar way that Dane does now of course they are using this information that they receive without permission in very different ways which is why we hate Zane so much and we're all kind of like not all of us but but a lot of people are looking at this as Zane is an intensic I really think that that like how would his mind reading be okay and Dane's isn't and so I think that that one point right there is why he shouldn't be one I'm not saying that he isn't but I personally as a reader don't like that idea because that would put him in way too similar of a camp as Dane 
And that's not cool. Well, I do wonder if, A, if he can control it, what does that look like? And B, I don't know. Like, I, I'm so here for this theory. I love it. It's going to get really muddied now because they do have the bond. So I do think, but like, it is literally seconds after she has landed now. Has he just, saw, like, did he just see a little violet hole in his mind and he's like oh like just dive right on in like how did that like did he just immediately start but the scalp prickles being throughout the entire book now I do remember saying this when we first started talking about scalp prickling it could also just be whenever the shadows notice her I think that's what it is but she's thinking about him right now she literally says the word Zayden in her mind and immediately we get a scalp prickle like the shadows didn't fucking hear that true And he wasn't looking at her in that moment. And that's why there's a lot of supporting material for this theory. And I, but let's also establish a difference here. There's a huge difference between him being a mind reader and their bond. Their bond is where they talk to each other. Now, mind reading is not that at all. I think that when he does start talking to her, yeah, that is strictly their bond. The bond, you have to talk through, like, I mean, she even says, like, there's a little shadow section of the archive. She goes through that shadow section. Exactly. He would just be like, Let me just read. Now, Rebecca Yaros has said that Zayn has a lot of secrets that we do not know about. I can't believe I'm saying this. I really do not like this idea of Zayden being someone who we love in book one and then takes a hard left turn in book two, three, four, five. If you know, you know. If you know, you know. I really do not want that for Zayden. And I don't think it will be considering the 107 lashes on his back or cuts or scars. I do not think he's going to be that level of hate character no but absolutely not I I do get really nervous with how many secrets he has because I do agree like this is definitely not in my opinion a romantic thing him being an intrinsic this is a huge invasion of privacy yeah so I do wonder like if he only does it when she's thinking about him but I don't think that's true I don't know I, I there's so many questions here and we could talk about it probably for an entire episode so that's just one moment I wanted to just point out because he was not looking at her because the other times scalp prickle it's he's looking at her he was not looking at her in this moment until she looks over and looks at him so there is another moment Zayden being intrinsic we're jumping way 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 ahead and this is the Taryn moment Taryn says do not dare and try to read me human or you'll regret it also there's a quote that says rare abilities when this is from Zayden rare abilities when kept secret are the most valuable form of currency we possess. So so these lines were initially what convinced me. However, I just just for just for shits and giggles, I'm going to play devil's advocate here because that's what I love to do. You can read this as the bond between us because, you know, Taryn does have that bond with Zayden when he is saying don't try to read me. And then he is very secretive about his shadow wielding. He does not broadcast that. So that could be what he's talking about, you know, with rare abilities, when kept secret, are the most valuable form of currency we possess. We talked last episode about why he doesn't wear his patches. This could be a reflection on that. That's how I prefer to read it because, again, I don't want him to be an intrinsic. So, all right, we're going to put Zayden to rest for now. <sighs> I'm not ready for this. It's time we to have talk to talk about, about it. We have to talk <laughs> about it. It's time to talk about the kiss scene. All the dragons come back from their Empyrean meeting and Melgren makes the announcement. Hey, it's good. I don't agree with it, which is notable, but it's good. Violet gets her mark and she's celebrating. She's, oh my God, I have a dragon. She's with her buds, her Indarna, her Tarn, and fucking Dane comes over and it's just like Violet you did it first and foremost the, the the second leadership is okay with it he finally gets to celebrate with her what is your uh, line of reasoning here Dane god I hate you so much Dane <laughs> <laughs> also later he says I honestly thought you'd be all right once Taryn chose you but he literally it, it's only the only reason he thought that she'd be all right because Taryn chose her is because leadership approved that Taryn chose her that's the only thing he thought would be all right just another way that Dane is fully putting his trust in leadership his he's so brainwashed this liar this motherfucking liar I will I will rant about this he says you have to know that I would do anything to save you Violet to keep you safe he literally less than 10 minutes ago (laughs) literally just said no I wouldn't I wouldn't do that and Violet knows it she says it in her mind but she does doesn't call on it and it makes that seem so so I'm actually going to come to Violet's defense here because she is 
she's seen who he is in real time. Yeah. He has been her best friend since they were five years old. And even though they have absolutely had their problems since she crossed the parapet, this is the first time that she is really and truly seeing him for who he is as that liar, as that person who is saying one thing and then his actions don't follow up with that. I think she's almost just like shocked. She's not able to even register a comeback because she's getting a huge info awareness download right now. And that totally. just sucks for her, you know? He then takes her head in his hands. Yes, we'll talk about that later. And makes out with her face. So whenever I'm audiobook listening or anything, I'm doing like coloring on my iPad. I remember taking my iPad and just throwing it on the bed and just being like, no. Again, he's trying to make this day all about him. All about him being with her. Like, oh my God, this is the start of our new relationship. Da, 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 da. Her new bonded dragons, brand spanking new bonded dragons are standing right behind her. She should be celebrating with them. She just got her relic. Instead, he is trying to make this day all fucking about him. I almost did a jig though, two seconds later, when she says, I don't want it anymore. And I was like, right? oh, fuck, yes. <laughs> it, it marks the end of an era so representative to Violet's hero's journey. Dane is the embodiment of her past life. You know, we talked about that. Shoot, in episode one about how we yeah. open when she's starting her new life. Well, Dane represents her old life that she's been trying to shed this whole book, right? And now she really understands it's him, not just his his thoughts, his, his behaviors, but him. Before we move on from Threshing Day, let's talk about Violet's new relic tattoo because it is awesome. Nicole and I both have some tattoos and we're we, getting another we one in December. <laughs> yes, our Harry Potter one we're going to get in December finally because I'm not fucking pregnant anymore. Jeez. I'm curious as to why she sees it through Andarna's eyes instead of Taryn's. And why do they not use this power more often? Like this is dope as shit. Y you would think so. And so I really do think that she and Andarna are, I'm I don't know if the right what the right word is, but Andarna will be like her main dragon. Like they are going to be like BFF. They're going to be really? closer than sisters. And I because they already have such a, I'll call it an emotional connection. And so I think that is why she's able to see from Andarna's eyes. I think that she could see from Taryn's eyes, but Andarna and her have already such a strong connection that she was the one who, yeah. who stepped up first. I do wonder if it's like only a baby dragon thing. Like, can you only do it if it's a feather tail? Maybe? Maybe. So of course her dragon tattoo, her relic, it is a black dragon with the small golden dragon in the middle and the wings spread and it touches her shoulders. It's so cool seeing the fan art for that. Question, now that Andarna is huge, does her tattoo change? And let's say that only babies are gold, which I don't think is the case, but let's say that it is, then how does that work with her tattoo too? Because originally I was like, well, it, she has to say golden. She is a golden dragon because her tattoo is of a golden dragon. But it's also of a very small dragon, and she is yeah. obviously not small anymore, so I don't think that logic is consistent. Is she still smaller than Taryn, though? We don't know. We just know that she's so. quote-unquote fucking huge now. So I, I kind of like the idea of the dragon tattoo growing. So my interpretation here is that it's going to end up being representative of that, that it does stay the same. We have not received any information that dragon tattoos can change, that relics do evolve. And I, I'm going to guess that they don't because we haven't heard that they do. So what I'm going to think here is that it is going to represent Taryn as like the dad, like the older, the wiser, their middle-aged grumpy dragon. And then Andarna is going to be the young, energetic, um, free-spirited one. And it's going to represent their ages, not necessarily their physical sizes. But I, again, okay, I, I have that. Yeah. So again, I, I have that. so many questions about how having two full-size rideable dragons is going to work for Violet. Is it going, mm -hmm. like, again, is it going to be Andarna more often because they have that emotional connection, or is it going to be Taryn because he's the more powerful battle one? If Andarna is still smaller than Taryn, she'd be easier to ride without a saddle. Will she need a saddle with her? I don't know. Very convenient. Very convenient. And, and, and so last thing that I'll say here on her dragon relic is I just love how it's a two-color tattoo, and Violet has two-color hair, and most likely, we don't know this for sure yet, but she will have two signets. She's just like, Two and two and two, and I just love it. We're going to put threshing to bed for now until God fucking damn it, Dane section. So in Mean Girls, when Damien is giving the like, 
this is how the cafeteria works. Like I, this just reminds me of that scene so much. And it's like their squad is the new plastics. Like everyone's like, yeah, sure. So and Gail, like I'll totally get out of the way. But right. what I love, 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 love more than the Mean Girls reference is how relatable this scene is. We do not go to dragon school. We do not, you know, fight for our lives every single day in that way. But we can all relate to finding a seat in the cafeteria. And I love how it brings you right back to the anxiety of high school where it's like, oh God, where do I sit? Like, especially on a day where everything of the power balance is totally fizz out. Like you don't know who's where. And I I just can remember that moment so vividly and God, do I not, not miss it. I was not a cool kid in high school. I was one of the kids who didn't even sit in the cafeteria. We would go in our cars and you smoke. Were weed cool and yeah, was, you were the cool kid. That's what You were the cool kid in high I didn't school. say that. I didn't say that you did. Meanwhile, I'd go into the theater and play video games. <laughs> Nicole and I became friends when I left for college, way by later. the way. <laughs> I was just, I was like really not expecting that power shift dynamic. But, you know, it, it makes absolute sense. And again, it reinforces how they are not the ones in charge. Humans fall into place with the dragons in the driver's seat. Let's talk about Jack getting forced out. So in the chapter 17 opening, which we're now in chapter 17, it says... One should be aware of a strong rider who bonds a smaller dragon. I know he dies, but this still feels really fishy to me because yes, we hate Jack, but we do have to admit that he is a strong rider unless he's like overcompensating for something, but I do not think so. Especially since Violet says feral dogs bite harder when they're cornered. I just think that this is just so connected here. I'm not in the camp where I think that Jack is still alive. I do not think he's going to come back as a venom. I think Homeboy is capital D dead. We talked last episode about Jack being a level one boss what if boss number two comes back in a similar fashion plus when everyone sits down you can hear Quinn mention that his orange scorpion tail is on the smaller side which is you know his smaller dragon but I also love that his dragon is orange and he's allergic to oranges it was doomed from (laughs) the start just so so ironic and beautiful so maybe the phrase about be one should be aware of a strong writer who bonds a smaller dragon is that these strong riders with smaller dragons are indeed overcompensating their, for lack of a better word, strategy to prove themselves, their drive to prove themselves spirals into even more ugliness. And it takes their limited power to the very edge. So maybe, you know, they're trying to overcompensate and pull more power than that smaller dragon is able to give them to channel to them. And we should also keep in mind what Professor Kaori points out that his dragon has bonded four other writers before him. And that is said as a bad thing, which shows his dragon's lack of good judgment in writers and their ability to stay alive in his weak connection to them. Think about it this way. It's like if in the span of one year, you go through four different cars. That says way more about you as a driver than it does about the cars you're driving, right? Like, that's kind of how I look at it. So so Imogen calls her little Sorengale. And, you know, the first read, you just don't think about it whatsoever. But another time, she does say Sorengales are weird, which, again, she is in front of Mira as well. So she is in front of multiple Sorengales. But she knows, she knows Brennan. She calls her little Soren Gale when she knows a bigger Soren Gale. She probably thinks Brennan is a little weird as well. And then seeing the other two Soren Gales too. So it might be looking more into it, but I just love that little nod there. I think that is 100% with Brennan involved. I, I think that was so deliberate. I always, on the first read, I took little Soren Gale as a reference to Lilith. Now Imogen saying she's going to help her with weightlifting. And then she says, that's the only way you'll survive. And then literally at that same moment, Moment, the hairs on the back of Violet's neck raise up. I'm just going to say it because this is another moment. This is like hairs in the back of my neck and scalp prickle are used pretty interchangeably. Was Zayden listening in on this convo? It could be through the through the shadows, but the hairs on the back of the neck really stood out to me. And also, this is the only way you'll survive. This is also the only way that Zayden, the, the guy who's literally in charge of saving her and many others' lives, it's not just her survival that obviously Imogen's going for here. As Zayden is peeling an apple with a dagger first and foremost fucking incredible I can see that so vividly and I love it meanwhile I'm like god that's so cliche like oh I love it if I looked over and saw someone peeling an apple with a dagger I'd be like 
Mm, fuckable indeed <laughs> my husband is the goldenest of golden retrievers <laughs> like oh it's so funny okay so she starts to notice how beautiful he is she begins to blush his eyes lock on hers and i quote her whole head tingles i took this as a, oh the bond is opening up or maybe this is like a faded like we could be running into a faded mates territory that just got super accelerated by her bonding with Karen. So this could be a whole head tingles, which is just like, you know, scalp prickling on steroids. I personally do not think it's just attraction, but I think that we are in different camps here. I do think that that, that's just a writing style to exhibit that she is attracted to him. Yes. I do think about like, okay, in those moments where I look over at someone when I had like a major crush or something and I saw them staring at me and they were maybe not peeling an apple with a dagger, but maybe they were doing something else that I thought was intimidatingly cool. I think that the head, the whole head tingling is a really good analogy for it. So upon, upon looking at my notes here, I'm like, ah, maybe that is. But moving forward, we do have have flying lessons first off how does violet not have a broken butt like this is ridiculous <laughs> she literally gets thrown in the air like she's something out of free willy and she literally falls back onto Darren's backside how does she do that without absolutely shattering her ass right especially because she has breakable bones right I I, I was yes. wondering that same thing it's like oh ouch Ooh, I'll tell you what as soon as Taryn said it's only a tiny bit of magic and therefore it really doesn't affect his powers you take his word for it and I would be like cool so I'm just gonna stick with that then you say you're cool with it I'm cool with it let's just move forward like yes I understand the reasoning behind you know there may be an instance later on especially in a battle where your dragon for whatever reason is not able to magically keep you in your seat so you should know how to do it on your own but I feel like I would personally take that take that risk like that that is a risk I would be willing to take to I guess take the easy way (laughs) you'd totally survive in the rider's quadrant legs absolutely we already know I wouldn't now here's what I will say in regards to this like think about it through the lens of their culture you know when you think about it that way where they are so hardened as like weeding out the weak that is 100% a golden spotlight on you are weak because you can't even stay on your dragon. I do see it. Does that mean I I don't agree with you? I 100% do. I'd be like, cool, dude. Thanks. Strap me in, bucko. I'm in for this ride. But the fact that they are such a hardened culture of weeding out the weak, that does make sense to me. But of that similar line of thinking, the saddle is a much more visible weakness highlight. Yeah, I was going to say it's a good compromise because it's something that he will always, hopefully, always have with him when she's on him. And it doesn't require magic. I think it's wonderful that they thought outside the box and got her a saddle. If I was someone who was looking on and was like, wow, I wish I had a saddle or hey, shoot, my sibling died falling off. Why can't anybody else have a saddle? People are not talking about the fact that she has a saddle more often, but we'll get to that part. And a wing leader gave it to her. As we get into the stripes, we do want to address something that has come up in a lot of our TikTok and Instagram comments. We've had a few DMs about this too. So some of the fan base is saying that scribes sign because of the scribes quadrants emphasis and value on quietness. While that is absolutely true, Violet does go into the archives and speaks out loud with multiple other people who are scribes and cadets. And Jasenia is the only one that she is signing with. So Rebecca Yaros, think about this. She is really good at show, don't tell in this book, especially when it comes to representation. So we feel confident that it is safe to assume this is one of those instances. We can see in the writing that Violet is talking to other people in the scribes, and then she is signing with Jasenia. That is why we're making the assumption that Jasenia is deaf. We do enter the archives for the first time officially in our story. So I do think it's so interesting to hear her say, for a second, I abhor the rituals and customs of the scribes like this really highlights how much she has chosen to become a writer she also says I cannot deny the truth I'm happy I weep at that line like full-blown ugly cry weep when she said that like I've listened to these stretch of chapters now more than I probably should in preparation for this episode and every time that line just stands so much out to me of wow like our girl is finally happy like that's so beautiful and for someone who's lost her dad and her brother like that is just such a beautiful beautiful thing so Violet also says maybe it's the archives but I feel a stab of homesickness this is just before she asks for the fables of the Baron and I think that's that sting of homesickness is really just her dad like she doesn't miss the archives she missed 
being there with her dad. I, I agree. And then a little later, you know, she's looking for her dad, even though she knows he's not there. When you've lost someone close to you, you do look for them. You, you look for any, any and, and you try to be close to them in any way you can. And, you know, Jasenia, she was horrified to hear that her friend was forced into the writer's quadrant. But I, I got some timeline issues here. So she also signs that they spent the last year studying for the scribe's entrance test together. Violet was training for the writer's quadrant six months prior. So was her training for the writer's quadrant a secret as she was still continuing to train or help her friend Jasenia? Okay. I don't think so. I don't think so. Be- because Winifred knew. So, and I think it was like becoming more and more, maybe not Jasenia, like she doesn't really have that high of security clearance by any means. But I do think that when they say like a year we were studying for a year. My guess is that they were studying like a year and a half and then they studied okay. that whole year. My guess is she like full blown stopped because her mom would have wanted her to spend every fucking second training. And then she so, wasn't allowed back in the scribes and so she hasn't had a chance to see Jasenia since she was literally pulled out of her training. I'm personally of the mind like that is just, you know, like, oh, we've been or we've been doing this for like a year and it's like a year and a half. Okay. The healers, however, they would definitely know that she is training. That wouldn't be a secret from them. Because she's going to have had a lot more bruises and and injuries. That's true. So they might be, I'll say, in on the secret. There is also mention about how first year it's speed information from the front lines. And it's said multiple times throughout the book to the point where I think that it is going to play a role going into Iron Flame. Does Jasenia play a part in the aftermath of the book's final battle? And she's the one who's like relaying information from it. I, I feel like it's it's so purposeful that first years help relay information and then there is a big battle at the end of this. Yes, I retweet. Absolutely. <laughs> exactly what you just said. So while she is in the archives, there is a moment that we have with Andarna. I'm just, again, I'm looking at everything through the Andarna is royal, I'm convinced, lens. So Violet is sad and Andarna says, it's hard to love a second home as much as the first. What was Andarna's first home? I don't, I think second home is the veil for her. I think that this is a very good question. But I am going to to dissect this a little bit because I would be absolutely shocked if the veil was not her first home. So the veil is magically protected because that is where all of the hatchlings are. Like that is the whole reason that the dragons and the humans have this partnership is to protect the veil where all their hatchlings are. But her current home is also the veil, which begs the question, what is her experience when she is saying this line? Like, is she simply being sympathetic because that's how wonderful she is? No, no way. There's there's got to be more to this. There is absolutely something more to this, but I really think her first home to be the veil but it's also her her new home too so i don't i don't have an answer but i don't know i don't know i don't either. know now violet does say it's easy when the second home is the right one and i think that says more about violet than it does in andarna in this moment but that just like oh it just further it further implements those she's really happy now after seeing Jack praise an unbonded who ends up bonding Glean, a dragon whose rider died on their very first lesson, Sawyer says that the unbonded do have a chance of still finding a dragon. But he says it in this way that's described as almost a- a somber. Do you think that he tried to bond a-, a dragon last year when he was unbonded? Or do you think he's worried about people coming and stealing his dragon that he finally bonded with? I, I think that that fear is is definitely there, just like it would be with anybody else. Maybe a little bit more magnified for him because he has already seen what happens. I don't think that he actively tried to bond one of the newly unbonded dragons last year just because he's such a good person that that's not in his nature. My first question is, how does an unbonded dragon bond with another rider or another cadet without threshing? Because are all of these unbonded presented to the newly unbonded dragon and then it just picks one out of the line? Because remember, cadets they can't go to the veil. There's definitely not another threshing because that's a huge event. Like how does an unnewly unbonded dragon bond with a unbonded a cadet? I don't know. That's such a good question though. I bet, of course, Sawyer was hopeful last year like anyone would be, but didn't go to like those bad bad guy links to, to make it happen. And again, on this point here is Jack exclaims, 
I knew it would work. What worked, Jack? What worked? Did he and his dragon cause the original writer to fall from Glean so his friend can and bond? I ab- like, I am convinced that that is exactly what that fucker did. Con- now, how did he do it? Did he rub Vaseline on the inner thighs of this fucker? I don't know. Like, how how would you do that? I don't know. Or The only other option would be that he's referring to how the unbonded cadet then bonds with the now available writer, that that's how that worked. Then, which, again, poses the question of, how the fuck does that all work? Of that, sa- of that same nature then, what if he took a, a leaf out of Violet's book and he gave the Glean's writer some kind of, you know how when, oh. when she's doing her challenges, someone like loses feeling in their legs, feet, limbs, like of some sort. That could have happened with Glean's writer and then they just slipped and fell right off and Glean is just not very kind and didn't go to get him. Yeah, I think that Jack is a little bit more in your face aggressive where he would have just had he his dragon poison. like rail into the writer. But we also don't get anything along those lines in the description when Violet sees that the writer fell. So questions. So many questions. How about things that we do know, which is Dane sucks. This is part two of Dane taking L's. Lexi, take it away. So like, I just find it so notable that Taryn like growls at Dane. Like he does not like him. Violet literally has to make sure that Taryn does not burn Dane. And <laughs> and it's like, girl, just trust your dragon. You, you know, if you have a dog who's a super sweet, snuggly, wonderful dog, and then you bring in some new boyfriend and all of a sudden your dog just goes ape shit and is super aggressive and all of that towards this new boyfriend you listen to your dog and you dump you, the boyfriend you dump the boyfriend you know like it's, except it's, with fire <laughs> it, except with a gigantic very 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 powerful dragon it's not your pet remember dragons are not the pets here the humans are why violet you gotta yeah. look at the signals i also love just to like further ingrain this taryn says tell him if he harms you or scorch the ground where he stands taryn you promised so you got it you got to follow up on this promise, my guy, in Iron Flame. I'm expecting it because Dane should have died nine times fucking over at this point because then Dane has the nerve to say, I would rather die than hurt you, Violet. You should have died. You should have th- died. This right here is one of my biggest problems with Dane. Like he really does think that this is a fact like that he would rather die than than have her harmed despite proving multiple times that this is not actually true like he has zero self-awareness and that is the kindest way to describe it like this brings it right back to why he demands trust from Violet in his opinion he more than deserves it because he has no fucking self-awareness that he doesn't follow through with his own actions he asks how he can help without realizing that the answer is to support, like really just support her. I also love that he comes out and he's like, I've let Professor Kaori teach you. He literally says it word for word. I've been letting Professor Kaori teach you. Wh- what? What do you mean? How, how, how have you let a professor, a professor at this college, and you're not even a third year. You're not even a wing leader. You're a second year. You are middle of the pack, my guy. How how has he just let Professor Kaori teach you? I mm, I will continue sweating if I keep talking about Dane. Violet says, ex- explaining about Taryn, he's basically growling at Dane. He's doing all this like an overprotective dad. And that just like talk about lines that just rip my heart open. I love that. I do have one more question about Dane here, though. How did he find out that Violet can't keep her seat? Did he read someone's memories or did he just finally hear through the grapevine that like, oh, yeah, Soren Gale can't stay in the air for five minutes? He's like, what? And then he stormed out. I bet it's option B just because he again, he's their squad leader. Like he should know these things as Violet points out to him. Do you love the idea that he did find out from someone else through accessing their memory like what if he was sparring with someone and was like holding someone in a headlock and then just like again that gets into that dangerous territory of the touching and the temples and and all of that so I don't know like I I think that he did just find out because someone he finally overheard someone or paid the tiniest bit of attention but that is a really good point let's move on to poor Jeremiah my guy did not get enough page time for how many questions I have for him. So Jeremiah is the guy who his signet is manifesting as an intrinsic and he's in the courtyard having a capital M meltdown. And 
this does beg the question that if Zayden is an intensic, what was that first experience like? He does have a lot of self-control. He does have like a really good grip on reality. So I'm assuming it probably wasn't as drastic as Jeremiah's. But what could have happened in that moment? Like, was he alone and he just broke down? I don't know, because because later on, Zayden does say that he could barely control his powers when he was a first year. Maybe he's not just talking about the shadows. Again, I think he is, yeah. but he could be talking about something else as well. Could Sagal have helped him hone them? I or right because remember he he has to be at school sometimes. So I don't <laughs> think that it, there would have been anyone at school who he could entrust to teach him. So I yeah. I'm thinking if if he is one that it would be Sagal. That makes sense. Yeah. So. He does say, if you value your secrets, clear your thoughts. Um, hello, Iron Flame. Hello, how Violet could clear her thoughts from Dane and not have to be Imogen wiped is my question. Like, because in the, someone, multiple people have actually pointed this out to us. In the Zayden POV at the end of this book, he does say that we're going to have to teach her to shield her mind or something like that. I do think there's somehow, because especially since how powerful her mind is she grounds in like two seconds flat when it takes most kids like weeks I do think she's going to learn how to clear her thoughts pretty quickly I do think that they're going to teach her and I do think that this is a big moment for a foreshadowing for iron flame so let's talk about the scene where the seven unbonded cadets come in and try to kill Vi this was also one of those scenes where this book just got turned up a notch for me where I was like Oh, shit. This is good. So rules like not attacking a cadet in their sleep, they really just need to be in place at settings like this. And they need to be honored because these writers and these cadets, they need to feel safe somewhere sometime or they would be extremely unproductive not being able to feel safe enough to sleep. Think about from Game of Thrones, Vastar Thrak, where there are no weapons allowed and there's this general sense of peace there so that they can get things done and not just try to kill each other. And, and then once when they leave, then they can go back to killing and hating each other. But there's like this sacredness of you don't do this. And that really does remind me of the rule of you don't kill someone in their sleep. Same thing in also in game of thrones like when you go under someone else's roof you take i can't remember the name of it exactly yes but like, that's why the red wedding was so fucking spoilers by the way that's why the red wedding was so big of a deal because they're supposed to be safe under anyone's roof when they're visiting because or else everyone would be afraid of this shit happening all the time we got to give violet some props here because holy moly yeah we, while we know that Violet would have died if Zayden did not come in and save her, she held her own against six armed people out for blood for a little while there. Like, I would have died in less than one second. She held her own at least until Andarna could channel her power and Zayden could come in and save the day. Good for you, girl. Good for you, Violet. I'm really proud of her. And then how she wonders, you know, in her final moments before she thinks that she's going to die, she wonders if she would have made it. She wonders if she would have made it to graduation. And this isn't the first time, and I don't think it's the last either, that we get a glimpse into what her final thoughts would be, you know? I just love that they're usually so simple and so actually dependent on the moment. It's not some grand, big final thought. It's it's so it's so small and meaningful in the moment. This is also going to be very like out of context or out of character for me as the hopeless romantic. I love that they're not about Zayn. I love that they're about her and her like ability to finally step into her own power and feel like she is actually doing something of true, true meaning in her life that feels really good. So I, I love, love that moment. So in Darna Stops Time does beg the question, Lexi, I'm going to give you a pedestal to just step up on what on earth could her number two signet be? Because we do know for a fact that it will not be stopping time because when you're a baby dragon, your gift is different than what you're going to channel into your rider when you're older. We'll get more into that in a second. What the hell is signet number two going to be? So that's like the most loaded question that has been asked so far on this podcast. So I am going, I think I'm going to wait to really dive into this until a later episode, but I have to say something on this because I have so many thoughts. Number one, I don't personally think it's going to have anything to do with time. I know a lot of people do. I personally don't. And my reasoning behind that is that's so I don't think that it is going to have anything to do with time. She's not going to go back and reverse time and bring Liam back. Like, I'm sorry. I, I wish it was the case, too. I personally do not think that is. 
you know, all everyone, all the time turners, they were destroyed. They were destroyed in the Battle of Mysteries battle. Like we can move on Alexi, from time. What what about Cursed Child? There is a time turner in Cursed Child. <laughs> no, we're not going there. Oh my God. We did the time thing. We're not like book one had the time thing. We're moving on. I really do think that Indarna's powers are going to evolve into something different as she's getting older. Whew, I'm still worked up over that I'm so child. Sorry. <laughs> I I hated it so much. Oh my god. You haven't we should we should know we have not seen the stage production. We know it's very different when you see the stage production. We just read the script, not book, script. It was the worst fanfic I've ever read. Okay, I maybe I'll have to do an episode one day of where me, I just like finally get everything about Chris That's, Wild off my ch- I will literally just hand you a mic and leave. I'll need to walk around so I can get like my my own channel powers out. <laughs> okay, back back to Fourth Wing, the book that we are currently talking about. Number 2 about Violet's second signet will be I think that it is going to have something to do with being on defense. I don't want to use the word protection because she does mention that Mira's power is stemmed from her need to protect. So I don't want to say it's going to be the same as that, but it is going to be something that counters her very offensive, very, I'll I'll say killer (laughs) signet that Taryn channels to her. You know, nature, it likes all things in balance, which we learn from Andarna. So I really do think that Andarna's channeled power will be something on the defense to counterbalance the one from Taryn. This is the first time seeing Zayden's power and being like, oh, oh, got it. I understand why this is fucking terrifying. He literally comes in, strangles five people immediately to the ground with shadows, and then kills Oren. Like, it was yeah. just done in two seconds flat. So Zayden's eyes, someone in our comment, I'm so sorry, I searched for this person for like 45 minutes. I looked at our emails. I looked at our DMs. I could not find out where this comment was. So I'm so sorry. I don't have the credit. But someone commented that Zayden's eyes have been described, you know, in the books, they're described as dark onyx, which is black and gold flex. And it was like, oh, like that's just such a cool moment. And this is one of those moments where she does see like the dark onyx of, of his eyes pretty, pretty intensely. So as he's like right post battle, Orin's blood is still dripping nicely on the floor. She's thinking to herself, thinking, I'm alive, I'm alive, I'm alive. And she repeats this mantra over and over. And Zayden says, yes, you're alive. And then she's like, oh, I didn't realize I said that out loud. Now, the first read of this, I was like, oh, that's weird. Moving on. Like, not that I did not think twice about it. The second read, I was like, oh, this is their bond. I still do think that this is a bond moment. And I'm very fully in the Zayden is an intensive camp. But I do think that because they are so linked in this moment, she is just talking through their bond in their minds without even knowing it. And then also in that same scene, she says, I'm fine. And then in her head, she says, I'm not. He whips his head to hers and says, never lie to me, which first and foremost is a little intense. My guy, you can be a little softer in this moment. She literally has blood on her floor. Calm down. That also is another moment where I think that it's being more heavily hinted, obviously, since their bond has opened through the dragons. Major credit to Zayden here, though. He says, I'd say there's multiple reasons for why you've made it this far. Finally, someone is giving her some fucking credit. Someone finally believes in her other than just Professor Kaori. I'm so happy. And obviously, Re. Don't forget about Riddick. But it isn't like not just like an exclaiming about what she just did, but it is a very good for you kind of moment. Also not as a squad mate cheering on a fellow squad mate. Exactly. It's in a, I'm in a leadership position and I'm noticing you just get, you just did a good job. Well done. The hopeless romantic, she has entered the chat. Zayden Ryerson saying, I know how to handle a corset. These words undo me. Besides that, this is such an intimate moment. It says his jaw flexes once and something that reminds me of raw hunger flitters across his expression before he locks it down. I love shit. Like this is where the enemies to lovers like that, that romantic tension, something about the words raw hunger also send things into my body. (laughs) There's still Oren's blood on her floor and she's almost like, I don't care. I'd fuck you on top of it. It's fine. She's like, my breaths are tight for entirely the wrong reason. But like, I think of like, I think about myself in this position because I've never been in this exact position before, but I have had very strong crushes. Obviously I'm a human. And if someone was in this moment with me where there's been like almost kindling in between us where that, that fire's there, I would not 
not be thinking about the blood on my floor either. I would be thinking about the hands on my back, the hair being gently, so gently tossed aside my, my shoulder. I love that he's so gentle with her hair. That's so cute. I also love that he needs to start asking questions and he like clears his throat to distract himself. Like he is literally undoing her corset and he's like, think about baseball, think about baseball, think about baseball. Like, but then, but then Violet hits him with the, I'm freakishly flexible. And you know that that baseball went entirely out of his head. You know that he's cataloging that for later. Knowing that if he can hear her thoughts through whether it's an intrinsic or through just the bond does make the scene so much more satisfying because she's saying I would have to be a masochist to sleep with you and then she's fantasizing about basically sleeping with him and then he retorts back with like masochist huh like "Uh uh-huh sure whatever you say Violet it's just moments like that make this scene so sweet to read but it's not like she can't see every single expression that's crossing through his face too which I love that that just evens the playing field with it the dragon they have a family meeting here everybody so for as many answers as we get when Zayden and Violet are talking to Sigal and Darna and of course Taryn we have just as many new questions as we do answers to our old questions so head over to episode three's archive section on dragons for most of the info download that we get in this chapter I'm not going to repeat all of that we're just going to start diving into the new questions that we have because you know me I love all my questions that I don't have answers to so Indarna says nature likes all things in balance what could this mean this is such an overarching theme of the book you know nature likes all things in balance and it comes up in big and small ways you know this balance in nature and I think that it'll be reflected in Violet's second signet you know that defense versus offense the light to Zayden Stark the nurturing and giving versus the lightning being a destructive weapon and I also wonder in more smaller details too this nature likes all things in balance think about Dane and Imogen's signets right they are in the same year they are both second years is it a coincidence that they both have kind of like yin and yang powers so nature likes all things in balance in order to bring brennan back to life or pull him right from the very clutches of death which is i think what we we think it is here that then the other writer had to die again that's just a really common theme throughout the book that we are going to see keep popping up here in the context of this specific conversation And Darna is referring to how she stopped time and gave this power to Violet. I reread this so many times trying to figure it out and my brain hurt trying to figure it out. Is she like referring to the gift that she gave Violet or is she referring to saving Violet? Like I don't know how that specific phrase fits into being any kind of answer in this context. So if you're listening and have any ideas about that, please comment, send us an email. Rebecca, if you're listening and have any answers, you know how to find us. What do you think Taryn's gift is? Because they have the gift still as adult dragons, right? It's a different gift, I should say. But they have a new gift as adult dragons that they do not give to their writers because they can control it. So what do you think Taryn's gift is? Thunder? So I think that it might have something to do with the sky. Now, we should also point out that we have not seen any of the adult dragons exhibit their own powers yet. Yet being a lot lot of heavy lifting on that word there. Now, another question I have here is what is the right of benefaction that Sigal mentions? Is this when they go to go bond for the first time at presentation day and threshing? What does that mean? I googled it. I could not find anything on it so I think it's a dragon term my guess is that it's some kind of ritual that they have to go through in order to be worthy of a writer but she let her go through it and then didn't expect her to bond afterwards so I don't no. That's a great point, right? I don't I don't know. Sigail knew and Darna was going to be going to presentation date, but she did not know that she was going to bond. Did and Darna know that she was going to bond, which I don't think so. Make get make makes another question pop up. <laughs> what makes and Darna so special to bend these very strict rules? We've asked that multiple She's royal. times. Yeah. She's royal. So another question, how did Andarna's parents die? Was it in a battle? Does it have something to do with why the dragons aren't bonding as much? Were they mated and when one died, so did the other one? Like I, 
I've even seen a theory floating around that Sigal and Taryn are in fact her parents, but she's time traveling so they don't know that she's theirs. I Again, I don't think that we're going to be going into time travel in the series no. more, but that I just need to throw that out there that I had seen that floating around. All right. Last thing that I have to say here about the dragon meeting is Sigal's quote here. The elders are already placing more stringent protections on the feather tails. Is this because they know Navarre isn't able to protect the veil as much as they always have is this why Violet's dad was studying feather tales? So side note here, Violet knows where her dad's study notes are, right? Does she ever find them? Does she need to find them? Because, you know, in her mind, she might be like, well, whatever my dad had to research, I already know because I, I have a direct connection to a feather tale here. But it is not a coincidence that in Darna came to threshing and chose Violet in a time of unrest in the country. And Violet's dad was studying feather tales. There is no way that is a coincidence. And I don't have the answers to it. You know me, I love I love answers. So that's why I, I need all the proof before I even begin to go into a theory camp. I have so many more questions about this. And I'm going to be paying so close attention as I continue my reread here. You know we're not going to get answers again until like 2027, right? And now for the moment we have all been waiting for. Liam has arrived to our beloved second squad. A few newish members of the squad are pissed because, hey, guess what? They're prejudiced against the marked ones. They suck. Including Dane. Go figure. He has blatant double standards when it comes to wing leadership. That is just so obvious for everyone to see. And he's prejudiced against the marked ones, specifically Zayden, too. You know, this is the worst part about him. He, maybe not the worst, but it's a bad say. thing. He thinks that he's a good guy, so he he makes every other excuse for why he hates the marked ones, why he hates Zayden. Now, I think that he does eventually warm up to Liam because Liam is so awesome and amazing, but he does have that initial prejudice here that he carries throughout his leadership. We just get a glimpse about how Liam handles it. He handles this prejudice from others, from his own squad here, with grace. He is the bigger person. And, you know, it just, it teases the conflict between Zayden and Amber. It'll happen in just a few pages here because her family was also tearish, but they did not support Fen Ryerson and the rebellion. So they were on the Navarre side of things, yeah. even though they were tearish from the tearish providence there. It just illuminates so much in that small interaction there about Liam coming on board to their squad. I also want to say I love how the squad leader of Liam's previous squad is like, sir, yes, sir, absolutely, no problem, sure thing. And Dane's like, what? wing leader? Like, you know, like he just does not have any respect for his wing leader and it drives me insane. Again, it's under like understanding that Zayden's dad was responsible for the rebellion you know, Dane is fully on the side of Navarre was the good guys and his dad probably was participated as well, you know, being the aide yeah. to the general. So I, I understand that initial prejudice. However, he is still his superior. He was chosen to be a superior. Like, yes, he needs to be given that opportunity. As we talk about wing leadership and making bad choices about putting the people in charge. Before we even dive into this whole thing, Nicole, I want to ask you, who did you initially think was the seventh female and writer who unlocked Violet's door? So I have such a boring answer to this, and that is I didn't think about it. So that's my boring answer. What about you? Amber did not cross my mind initially. No. I thought it was going, I was thinking of some other like smaller character shocker, like um, like Tara, for instance, like, you oh, know, just yeah. other like female character names, like Imogen did cross my mind too. And yeah, but I, Amber was not my number one. So it was really exciting when, because at first I was like, wait, are we even going to find out who this person is? And then it's like, of course we find out in the most dramatic way possible. <laughs> my guy loves his dwell. This is not even a Dane taking L's because his L's are so, he has such a high bar for L's in this section that this does not even count. Before we even get into the worst of it, he doesn't look Violet's direction as they come up for morning formation. Like he is still so mad at her from their having it out the other day. The death roll is red. Liam is also switched into their squad and he didn't look at her fucking once. And then when he does, he's absolutely shocked and has the audacity to get mad at her for not telling him first. He makes it all about him. He is so fucking selfish. He's just like the most poisonous version of the boy next door. 
And he, you know, makes every girl who's ever had a gaslighting boyfriend rally around and just give his, this fictional character like the gigantic middle finger. I mean, do you think any of us have had some traumatic ex-boyfriends? Jesus Christ. If you're not watching on YouTube, I just raised my hand there. He says, get up there and tell everyone he's lying by. The fact that this guy has the odd audacity to say everything about this is wrong because Amber's a wing leader. And also, let's not forget that Amber wing leader, also Amber Dane fucker. She and him had a thing first year. So his first year, her second year. Also keep that in mind. Like, that is not something to just graze over. And then he does the unthinkable. And welcome to Dane taken L's part three in this podcast. This is like a gigantic L just like ramming into yeah. him and knocking him off the gauntlet cliff. Like, Jesus. <laughs> oh my God. It's a giant bite hanging balls all over again. <laughs> Just a giant hanging L. He says, let me see as he lifts his hand like he's going to cup her face. First of all, cup is not a coincidence here. That is so deliberately done to make us suddenly be like, oh, anytime he cups her face, that that is so notable because that same language. He also then says, give me the memory. Now, again, I'm working on outline for episode five right now. And we have this moment with Dane where he's like, I didn't even ask you. Go don't he had no idea that he didn't even ask her and that to me is like this place cuts you down to the very core of who you are this right here is the very core of who he is again it's him thinking he's the good guy and he's not. I love that Sawyer and Riddick come to stand to Violet's side. That little addition just is so beautiful. And, and Rhea like squeezing her hand like she's just got like such wonderful friends who are rallying around and supporting her. And then there's fucking Dane. I find this interesting that in the middle of literally the world is like doing a 180 here. Violet finally admits that she wants Zayden. She's like, I admire him. Oh my God, I'm so fucked. I want him. It's the only reason she hasn't quote unquote celebrated with other people is because she wants to celebrate with Zayden. This made me, on first reread, this made me nervous. Now this kind of makes me go like, where are your priorities? <laughs> like, where are your priorities? I, I know that I'm in the minority here and I'm not going to dwell on this because we're all about positivity and loving this book. But I need to point out one small problem I have with it. There's slow burn and her contradicting descriptions about Zayden, which I get. They are explained like in in her head. She knows that she's contradicting herself. It's honestly my least favorite part about this mm. book. Like once when Violet finally admits this to herself, it's like we can move on with the story. But, you know, I love me some Zayden and I love Violet. She is one of my favorite female main characters in a book series. But the like, God, he's so fucking hot too. Oh, he's trying to kill me despite saving my life for the last, you know, several months. Every time he's around, like this description, like her narration of it was so in my face that it was honestly a little bit distracting from the moment itself and from Zayden himself, too. I will say I actually do agree with you on this point, Lex. Oh. I do agree with you, actually. I'm surprised by that. The back and forth does jar me. Now, if I put myself in Violet's shoes, knowing like, oh, my God, I have this attraction to this guy. But my entire life, I've heard that he killed my brother. He is, you know, the the devil himself reincarnated. Like, I understand why there's this constant dichotomy. Yes. Do I think it's sometimes in our face? Yes, I do. Do I think that the contemporary language here, like the holy fucking hot or something like that, like sometimes the language I'm like, oh, like interesting. I do think that there is some like this is a very strange comparison here is like, you know how in Order of the Phoenix, everyone is like, oh, my God, Harry's just such an asshole all the time. I think it is so fucking deserved. I love Order of the Phoenix for the reason that I think he is acting exactly how I would expect a 15 year old boy to act. Now, obviously, yes. they're here in their 20s, but I, I do think that she is acting in the way I would exactly expect a person who is incredibly attracted to this fucking delicious man and also having been told her entire life that he is not a good person. So she's acting in a way that I do think is deserved. Is it a little distracting for me as the reader? Yes, but do I think it is a accurate representation of the teeter-totter that's going through her mind? Yes. I will give you that. Yes. We come back from Violet fantasizing about this man to burning Amber alive. There's no good transition there. There's really no good transition. I tried it, <laughs> <laughs> so I do want to say, though, because after hearing Amber, you know, screaming like Clyde, Clyde, all you know, her dragon's name. I wonder what Clyde's name is. Lexi, do you want to know what his name is? I, I certainly do. You hid it from me in the outline. So I, I did. find out right now. I put it in our invisible ink. It means graveyard. 
<gasps> See, if we knew that, it'd be like, oh, she, she's dead. Oh. It is time for my favorite section of the podcast, which is God fucking damn it, Dane. This is where we look at all of the instances where Dane cups Violet's face and we speculate about what the fuck he was trying to learn from her. So the first and second face cuppings are right back and forth. Lexi, do you want to talk about the first one? I'd like to point out that I caught this and Nicole didn't. So Shut I'm up. very proud of myself because I have not gotten most of the other ones and she has been really carrying this section. First touch is right after Dane races over to Violet after she finds out that she gets to keep both dragons and he's acting like he did not just try to force her to choose Andarna. So that's the first time. Now it's the second time here, Nicole, in that same stretch. Literally in like a page and a half later, maybe less than that, he touches her face right before they kiss. And he says, as he has his hands on her, look what Ryerson said. So he's referring to what they said in the face-off and how Zayden was like, would you have stepped in and helped her? And Dane was like, no, because the rules. And so he says, look what Ryerson said. I think that he's trying to see the memory of how Violet felt in that moment of like, oh my God, my best friend wouldn't step in. They also had just, they, meaning Zayden and Violet, had just had a private conversation after Zayden dismissed Dane. They had had a private conversation about the mated pairs, about how they're now, you know, their destinies are literally intertwined. Their lives are literally intertwined now. So I could see Dane also touching her face to want to know what that conversation was. That's the one I'm leaning more towards because I think that he's already working with leadership in my opinion he's already working with leadership on on oh. figuring out what Zayden is doing I think it's right after he finds out about the marked ones meeting he starts talking with leadership I still am not convinced I I know I said it on the air that you had convinced me but I might be taking that back I'm really sorry but I am not convinced that Dane knows about that meeting because he, he literally would have is said glaring something. he is glaring glaring at but what Zayden if he's, what if he's not saying something but he's because he He's now spy for leadership. Yeah, did I just fucking convince you again? <laughs> gonna put a pin in that okay mm -hmm. that's the safe answer the third moment is when his hand grazes over her cheek this is again right before they kiss these three moments have happened back to back to back his hand grazes over her cheek and it's described as his eyes are searching for something so I don't know if this is him actually reading her memories or if he's just searching for any signs of her having feelings for him that's kind of the one I'm leaning towards I actually don't think that this this is the one instance where I'm like I don't think that he was reading her memories I think he He's like, I'm about to kiss you. You game? You cool? So, so I have a question about this. Dane is reading her memories, not her thoughts and feelings. There is a huge difference between that. So would he have been needing to look for memories that reflect her feelings? Like, is he like typing into his Google search? What does Violet think about Dane? You know, and then pulling up conversations with Zayden or even Rihanna. She talks to Rihanna about Dane quite a bit too. I'm just curious how that works because it has to be an actual memory, not her feelings. But here's, here's where I think about it would be a memory through Violet so a firsthand account that that Violet is experiencing and through a firsthand account you would be able to gather I took it would as you? you'd be able to gather feelings I don't know that's would that's kind of just I don't know that's been kind of my headcanon with it I do wonder if he does know about her and Zayden and the chemistry that they have because to your point here Lex if he can't feel feelings through memories then he wouldn't know how strong of a attraction she has to Zayden which would explain at the end of the book when he's like you choose him and he yeah. does seem genuinely surprised so I actually ooh, that's a really good point I like that a lot yeah. so those are the first three that happened I do think that he was reading her memory to try to figure out what did Zayden say in their private conversation that's like that's my head canon. number four happens right before she goes to lift weights with Imogen so what happens right before this right before it there's talking about flying lessons he asked about last night which was you know him referring to the kiss that they had and this is all before by the way this is all before he says it shouldn't have happened that's notable at least in, in my mind here because my thought process is he's cupping her face he's asking about last night if he can read feelings so this is in in the camp of if he can read feelings is he trying to see what their experience was with their kiss last night because if so he could have seen like oh she wasn't 
into it and then he's rejecting her in the next thing or is this him <clears throat> figuring out how the hell are you suddenly being trained by Imogen right now no because this is before he learns that it's Imogen so never mind I don't think that's true so I don't know what he was searching for in this moment but I want to open up these possibilities so the memory that he could have pulled was just earlier that morning when Rihanna asked Violet about her and Dane because everybody saw them kiss and Violet admits to her friend that she didn't feel anything so that could have been the memory that he pulled. That is my headcanon now because right after, you know, his hand is cupping her face and he's saying it never should have happened. I love it, at least in my headcanon, because I hate Dane. He wants to reject her like, oh, like, you know, I want to be in control of the situation. Fucking shocking. His gaze drops to her lips at one point. And that makes me think like, oh, he wants to kiss her again. But he stops maybe realizing that, oh, she's actually not into this and it even says his eyes are heavy with sadness I don't understand however him saying the whole like I'm saying the same thing you are the the whole politics he doesn't want to muddle all of it like it does kind of weaken this theory but what are your thoughts I, I think that he is being honest about the the politics side of it like absolutely I think that that would be like his, his driving factor of why he kind of came to her about this in the first place but he was kind of doing his double check right and yeah when he saw how she felt and it did not align with how he was feeling, it was like he really drove home the politics part of it. Again, the Dane hater in me is like, I think he's saving face. I think he was like, I want to be the one to reject you, you know? But but then he does get really excited when he mentions, you know, talking about them being together after graduation. He would have been saying that after he read the memory that she was not interested in him. Like he could have also just been like, sca- like Googling Zayden and like seeing, did Zayden talk to her? Did Zayden talk to her? Did Zayden? Nope. Okay, we're good. Like, because if he is working with leadership, he is specifically looking for Zayden. So that is another thing. And he just could have come up dry. I firmly believe that he started working with leadership after Dane's dad saw her and Zayden together. That's that's what I think. Is this added to the list now? When did Dane start working with leadership? Yes. Yes, we are adding right. that to the list there. So let's just do a quick little face touch count. If we're doing face only, there are four in this stretch of chapters. We're up to chapter 20 now. And that is totaling in eight in the whole book up until this point. Now, all other touching, there's four different parts in this chapter. Like he he tugs her hand post-threshing. He grabs her shoulders. Now, originally I was like, oh, well, he, if he grabs her shoulders, like there's probably clothes there or flight leathers. Incorrect, because later when she's looking at her tattoo, she says that she can see it peeking out of her vest over her shoulder. He grabs her hand after threshing again, and then he touches her shoulder again when she's going to work out with Imogen. That is a total of non-face touches in the entire book up until this point, 18, totaling in 26 full touches, both face and anywhere touch up until this point. 26 counts. Let's close out the signet part of this discussion with foreshadowing. Good God, this is the longest episode we've ever done. There are the patches on their uniforms. And we've talked about this a little bit, but there is a really cool moment because shouts to Crystal on TikTok who found this little nugget. I love Crystal's videos. When you are in a squad that has the most surviving members since Parapet, you get the Iron Squad patch. The fourth wing emblem is a flame shaped patch there's an iron flame book coming out anybody she's also in flame sections something that dawned on me was like if Andarna's second signet to her or the Andarna signet to her is fire because that's also something we don't hear very often I don't think we hear about fire wielding well somebody was going to be a fire wielder and then they literally exploded in flame <laughs> in class no like that Sorry, happens. I should not laugh at that I should not laugh at that and it almost got rid of our boy maybe that is foreshadowing too she's also going to be she'll be a flame wielder now that would be two destructive signets so I I don't think so but that was just another tie that I thought about I believe that iron flame absolutely has to do with the name of either like the rebellion that she's part of or or kind of like how fourth wing is in this book I think that iron flame will be more of a representation of a group that she's part of in the second book so I love this theory I am I'm going to start poking at it because that's what I do best is that every single year we also know that the patches do change while I'm assuming it's the design not the meaning behind the patches that do change now why do they change every I was gonna year? ask why do they is it like to you know help these writers mask their strengths until then, others just find it out why right? have or, patches at all in that case like right they're, we know that they're not allowed to wear their distinguishing patches in battle in case they get caught you know in enemy lines why change the patches every year here a 
Dane foreshadowing moment. He says, I'm determined to be a wing leader next year. We do not have confirmed, but we can highly, 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 highly assume that from the Iron Flame excerpt that Dane is a wing leader. We also get a mention of Wyvern, Venon, Magic, the battles of good and evil, you know, the good stuff, the battles of good and evil in Indeed, Violet, yes. And Jasenia couldn't find this tome in the archives. She couldn't even find anything about Wyvern or Venon in the catalog. That is, and it like takes Violet by surprise. She's like, really? We also do meet Jasenia Nelwert in this section of the book. And that is highly notable because she's the author, technically. Obviously, Rebecca Yaros is, but she is the person who is scribing this tale of ours and that is the book dedication that has a lot of fans literally up at night Uh, just as we're talking about like going back to like the wyvern and all of that violet wants to know more about what happens when you defile the channeled power you know she quotes i know i've never read of a single writer losing their soul to their powers the dragons keep us from that I don't know if that's foreshadowing, but I feel like that's very notable. On our first day of flying lessons, quote, can't help but notice he's taking everything Kyori is doing and making it harder. Yes. So Taryn is, Taryn knows that she might be called into service early and she'll need all the packages she can get before the Wyvern are coming. Like he has so much more information and that is why he is preparing her in a way that nobody else is getting, yes. which is a huge issue with how they're being trained and we've wondered before how much Kyori and the other professors know. When Jeremiah's signet power is manifesting as an intrinsic, Violet recites, quote, book of shit. And in this, we find out that many Navarian defense posts exist beyond the wards and are considered zones of imminent danger. Hmm, I wonder if we'll go there. Ha ha ha. Dane says, she's a wing leader, Vi. I'm not about to question her integrity. Dude. Everyone else did. Everyone else did. So let's talk about Violet's dream real quick. We didn't talk about it in our key insights. This is such a heavily foreshadowing moment. When Violet is sleeping, this is right before she's getting woken up by Taryn, who is letting her know, hey, there's seven people who are about to kill you. Her dream is her dad and her in the archives. And her dad says, firsthand accounts are more accurate. You have to see who's telling the story. It's the scribes who have the real power in this world. I get chills. I don't even need to explain that. When Zaydan points out that Violet didn't go for the kill shot and Violet whispers that she has never killed anyone, she she is not a killer at heart. She does not identify with that kind of philosophy. And that is certainly, unfortunately, going to change. It'll come with so much guilt and fear. Like, even to kill someone who deserved to die like Jack, like, she is so riddled with guilt because she does not go for the kill shot. She never does that on purpose. And... She accidentally ended up doing it. And then at the very end of the book, she she doesn't really think of Venon, I guess, highly as she thinks of Jack because she just goes for the fucking kill, right? Understandably. But it really is just her evolving as a character. And the last foreshadowed moment, this is more of a foreshadow speculation, is Violet to Dane. She says, touch me without permission and you'll spend the rest of your life regretting it. I really hope he does because she learns that he has been touching her in a way without permission, in a way that definitely has him reading her memory. And also in that very same scene, Violet thinks, how have I forgotten that his signet is the ability to see memories? Like every other fucking reader on their first read. I know that there are those unicorns out there. That's great. I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to us mere mortals who totally forgot that Dane's signet is a memory reader. And that's what makes the like kaboom drop at the end of this book. Like, oh, God fucking damn it, Dane. Love that there's just that super meta line that right there. How have I forgotten that his signet is the ability to see memories? Yep, me too, girl. Me too. Of all the things for you to forget, Violet. Oh, goodness. So today's archive section is going to be very short because I'll be completely honest with you. I accidentally covered the scheduled topic, dragon bonding, in last week's archives. So today we are going to cover religion. We don't know a whole lot about it, but we do learn about a few of the multiple gods in this universe. So when people talk about them, they say, oh, thank the gods. You know, oh, gods, which god are you calling out for, right? There are There's only me in this room, Violet. (laughs) And I don't share. Do I have that entire scene memorized? Yes, Yes, I do. (laughs) So we know that there are quite a few gods. We don't know how many of them, but we do know about just a few. First of all, we have Amari, who is the queen of gods. So renderings of her have high cheekbones and an oval face. There was, is a temple of Amari, which is the most noted landmark in Orisha. And also like think Amari is a phrase. So sometimes they switch out 
an actual god for the gods, especially when it applies to very specific instances here. Another god that we know about is Zanal, who is the god of luck. For instance, Violet wants to send prayers up to him when she really needs her luck. Another one is Dune, who is the goddess of strength and war. So Violet reflects how she should be going to Temple more to make multiple appeals to her because she realizes, oh my god, I am going to have to be going into battle someday. And last but certainly not least, the one that we know the most about is Malak, the god of death. As you can imagine, Malak is very prominent in the writer's quadrant. Quote, may their souls be commended to Malak is a send-off for those who have died and that is said every single morning as they wrap up the death roll. You don't want to cheat death to piss off Malak. You know, that is considered really treading on his territory. When someone dies, part of the ritual is burning all of their belongings. This is a tribute to Malak. I'm going to go ahead and quote one of the top sections from the chapters here from Major Rorley's Guide to Appeasing the Gods, Section 2. I could really use that book to flesh out this archive <laughs> section. It is a grave offense against Malak to keep the belongings of a dead loved one. They belong in the beyond with the god of death and the departed. In the absence of a proper temple, any fire will do. He who does not burn for Malak will be burned by Malak. Whew. After the battle and Violet wonders if she's dead, she thinks maybe she was sentenced to an eternity of torture by Malak for her recklessness. Kind of like a Satan slash god of death figure here. Dragons, on the other hand, quote, pay no heed to their puny god. Not surprising considering how powerful dragons are in and of themselves. Like they just don't care about humans' idea of gods and, and appealing to them. I have a quick question for you. Since there's not a whole lot on the internet about the gods, did you go into your ebook and type in each god and just look at what was said around them? Yes. At first I typed in God and then I did gods and then I did goddess. And then I pulled out every single one that I found and did that. I tell you what, everyone, I'm going to be a little bit nervous for these archive sections when we get to Iron Flame because there's going to be no source material <laughs> on the internet for myself. So please cut me some slack. Speaking of which, I do want to note before we wrap this section up that I made one mistake that one of our listeners, Bryce, nicely pointed out to me. Coda, General Melgren's Black Dragon is actually not a Morning Star tale. I, I misspoke, said that he was. Only Tern has a Morning Star dragon tail and then Coda has a sword tail. So mm -hmm. I apologize about that. And please know that we are mere mortals here on this podcast. We are going to make mistakes. We are very imperfect. If you do notice we make a mistake, we appreciate you very kindly pointing it out and we will correct it on this podcast because again, we are not perfect. And honestly, who knows? Half of this shit is probably going to be irrelevant in three books. So we have no idea. Let us close out this episode with taking flight with our favorite moments. The way that Violet smiles at Jack when he's told his shoulder injury needs surgery like she was never really scared of him but now she is just so coming to her own just owning him and knowing that she is better than him she's more courageous than him she's more powerful than him she does not run from a fight and she knows it and just and he smiles does at him he does run from yes a fight. professor kaori saying something tells me that they've been waiting on the others to get back before they meet violet says the leadership kaori says the dragons and that part like I get chills like that to me is just the Empyrean series in a line right there of course yes. Professor Kaori everything Violet says standing up to Dane I don't have to go over it I literally went through it in detail just a second ago but it's worth mentioning that is a favorite Nicole moment Zayden exclaiming Violet's freakishly calm for someone with a target on her back and her response is a typical Wednesday for me. Imagine her saying that at the beginning of the book. She knows that people are out to get her and she still like, you know, pushes through day in and day out. But like she's come so far. I'm so proud of our girl. I do also want to point out that one of our followers on, I believe it was TikTok. Again, I'm so sorry. I do not have your name right off the top of my head. But they were like, it was very jarring hearing the word Wednesday <laughs> in a fantasy book. And now I just love Riddick lines so much. He is such a wonderful character. Quote, look who rode in on the baddest motherfucker around. When he's asking Ree where her relic is, she goes, somewhere you'll never see. And then he goes, oh, you wound me. I want to know where her relic is. Like, Oh, it's 100% like, on her ass. Like, does she have like a tramp stamp or like, where is it? <laughs> okay, uh, that's my new headcanon. I hope it's a tramp stamp. And then when Violet just thinks how terrible it's going to be when, when Riddick learns how to magnify his voice. Like, I just love that. She's like, oh my God, we're all so screwed. And then last but not least, fuck me. It's always something around here. Yes, it's it is. There's always something that's going to kill them. Sawyer bonding a red sword tail. I like almost cried for this first time. And then also later he's the first to manifest his signet. So freaking deserved. I love my guy Sawyer. Writers 
absolutely having a sex party under the Buzz Guyeth roof the morning after threshing. So the unabashed joy that I get when the writers get laid is honestly very strange. But when Sawyer comes out of Ree's room, I wanted to do like a full on fist pump in the air. Like, and even Liam got yeah. laid. I'm so proud of our guy, Liam. He walks out with someone. We don't know who it is the morning after threshing. And then I love Ree saying, so why haven't I heard you celebrating to Violet? I love her. She's just such a good friend. Of course, we have to do the favorite Taryn lines of this episode when he like grumbles and she's like, what does that mean? He goes, the closest translation for humans is probably for fuck's sake. (laughs) Then Violet is asking, oh my God, are you always around? And he goes, yes, get used to it. (laughs) And then she's like, the fight to urge the uncontrolling, intrusive, overbearing. He goes, still Still here. here. (laughs) And then when she's like, oh God, like, you know, that guy, speaking of Zayden, you know, that guy annoys me he goes annoys you is that what you call it when your heart rate she goes stop like I just love that he's just such a overprotective dad like I but he's also kind of a pimp in this moment and I will get into that in next episode and they just speaking of Zayden and Taryn like the way that Zayden just goes head to head with him when they're having their family meeting with the dragons like they're both on the same team supporting Violet and they often even have similar approaches but like, so they're so similar that they butt heads. And, and then we just have Sigail here in the middle of everybody. She's like the mom who's caught between a dad and the son. I can't wait to hear more from Sigail. I really hope we get more Sigail next book. I, I'm sure we will, but I'm very excited. I also love that Taryn and Zayden both have nicknames for Violet. Taryn is Silver One. Obviously, Zayden is Violence. And then last but not least, I love the idea that Violet is just like oh god I miss sex and then Riddick's like I'll oblige and she's like I miss good sex first of all right in front of Dane because Dane can totally hear this and it's such a satisfying slap in the face but then also in the Zayden POV that I've talked about a few times on the podcast because there's shadows around everywhere he hears her as well and he's on the dais like distracted all of a sudden and it's such a good scene. I'll link it in the show notes again if anyone wants to read it because it's so good. Friends, wow, that was a long one. But you know what? You all are still listening. So we're going to assume that you're not afraid of these long podcasts, which we're very happy about. Please, if you're not already, give us a follow on TikTok and Instagram at Fantasy Fangirls Pod. Tag us in your videos. Tag us in the videos that you see. Nicole, we we were tagged in an American Ninja Warrior video so please keep it coming we love it so much thank you and also please do not forget to rate and review the episode last time we were talking and freaking out about how we were number 12 in our category we got up to number four in our category holy shit what is happening please if you have not already take a second to rate the podcast on whatever platform you're listening on if you are listening on apple Podcasts, please 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 take a moment to write a little love note in that review section it is so helpful with helping other people find the show. Plus, it gives us many opportunities when we get higher up the charts to do really cool things that we have planned up our sleeves. Um, Rebecca, we want to interview you. That is something we are we're planning on a bunch of different things. And the higher we are on the charts, the more people listening to the show, we're able to do that. Which, speaking of which, share with your fourth wing friends the amount of texts that I have gotten from my friends being like, hey, I haven't read fourth wing yet, but I'm going to share it with my friend who has. Please be that friend who texts another friend saying, hey, there's this really cool podcast. And also to close this out, do not forget to send us your questions for the Ask Us Anything episode. You can send them to our email, which is fantasyfangirlspod at gmail.com. You can also DM us on Instagram and TikTok. Again, we're fantasyfangirlspod. But please, please, please send us your questions. We're so excited to do that episode. Next week, we are going to be covering chapters 21 through 26. It's going to be one of the longer stretches of chapters that we got here. So expect another long episode. Thank you all so much for listening and we will see you next week. Bye.